The promise of this book is not the dream job. The promise of this book is not, oh, the promise of this book is opportunity. Mm -hmm. But when you get the opportunity, now, now I firmly place the ball in your hands. It's a handoff, okay? Mm -hmm. We said hut, we said go, you're running, you got your hands open, I've given you the proximity principle, you will get opportunity if you practice it. But what you do with it mm -hmm. is up to you. And you and I, we have practiced proximity. As a result, we have gotten opportunities. But I want people to hear, like, I didn't practice the proximity principle and then get the opportunity to host the Entree Leadership Summit and interview Peyton Manning mm. and Sarah Blakely and Condoleezza Rice and all the other people you hear on this program. Mm -hmm. That's not how it worked. I want to tell you the first two hosting gigs I did, the first live hosting gig I did was Swanee Day in Swanee, Georgia, and I introduced <laughs> a balloon animal artist, the guy who was making animals out of balloons, and a mime. <laughs> so I want you to understand there is no next step if you don't take the first step. That's so great. And I'm going to tell you, for most of us, the first step is not glamorous. Mm. It's humiliating. But I think it's where you have to swallow your pride and say, I'm willing to do whatever mm -hmm. it takes for how long it takes. Well, and don't you find that the first step is also part of figuring out what you actually want. I mean, I, oh yeah. So this you, you had yeah. a really clear vision early, but a lot of people. I, I know in my story, I didn't know 15 years from now I want to be a Dave Ramsey doing these kind yeah. of things. This thing called entree leadership that didn't exist. I didn't have all yeah. that vision. Well, that's but a I good was point. in an environment. I knew, I knew I had to get to a place where yes. those kinds of things could come up. Yeah. So again, back to my personal journey here, so that you see how this is illustrated. So I thought it was sports media. So once I realized it wasn't politics, it was me, I thought, well, it's sports media because I love sports so much. So I thought, well, it's going to be sports talk. Mm. That'll be great. So I did all these things. You've heard some of this stuff. But I got to a point where I started uh, volunteering. Hear this, people. I had a successful business, but I was spending three days a week, a couple hours of those three days, at the ESPN affiliate in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was screening phone calls, getting Sprite for guys who were on air making half of what I was making. Mm. Again, swallow my pride. I'm going to get in proximity to the right place. And as a result, after about two months of that, they put me on air. I started doing remotes. And so they were putting me on air. I remember driving to Nashville on my dime to the SEC basketball tournament, and I was doing phone-ins from the media room. I thought I had arrived, but understand, I paid. I stayed with our, our good friend Bill Hampton, so I crashed at a buddy's house. I paid for my gas and my own meals, and it was my cell phone, mm. and, but they gave me the press pass, and I had all access. And John Calipari's up there on the, on, the, on the days after the game, and I'm asking him questions. And then I'm calling in every hour after every game doing live remotes mm. from the SEC men's basketball tournament. And I thought, man, this is great. I'm on the air. Now, here's what I want people to understand. I did that, and it did more things, Falcons mm -hmm. training camp. And then I got myself on uh, Comcast Sports Southeast because of those radio guys at 680 The Fan. It's approximately the right people. Mm -hmm. They put me in the right place. I pitched a segment, got it on, produced it myself, paid for it all, did three of those and ran out of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I couldn't do it anymore, but I proved to myself I could do it. But right. here's what I learned, to your point. It was in that moment that I realized it's not sports media. So I got myself in proximity. Mm -hmm. But it was the proximity to sports radio or sports television. And I got there and I went, huh, I like the performance part of it, but something's missing. And so proximity is also powerful for clarity. It broadens your horizon to for what clarity. you're doing. Right. Wait mm -hmm. a second, I think I want to get into uh, cybersecurity. Great. So start hanging around dudes that are in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Have lunch and coffee with them. Ask if you can chat them for a day. Here's what's going to happen. In getting in proximity to somebody who's doing what you think you want to do, clarity comes, confirmation mm -hmm. comes. It's either confirmation that, yep, this is exactly what mm -hmm. I thought it was. Oh my gosh, if I could do this, I'd be stealing yeah. money. Or, huh, I, yeah, this kind of, I kind of yeah. like this, but boy, when he told me this and I learned right. about this, I went, this is not aligning. Or you meet a mentor who shows you there's 10 times more possible in you than you were even thinking about your own vision for yourself. That's exactly and they, right. And they broaden your That's horizons. That's exactly right. Okay, I want to come back to, you said something earlier that, our listeners cannot miss. You came on your own dime. You crashed with a buddy. You're investing in the proximity principle. A lot of people can want proximity, but they don't want to pay the price to have it. 100%. 100%. You can't just go, oh, I just want to be in proximity. And they, no. I mean, what are you going to do to get there? Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. And then, and then let's add the rest of this. 
what are you willing to do to get in proximity? And then what do you do when you get in proximity? Because remember, just being in proximity has a lot of benefits, okay? So, you know, when I was hanging around that radio station and I was doing some of the things that I was doing, I was in proximity. I was learning. I was getting a chance to do and I was getting a chance to connect. By the way, those are three things. I'm, I can't help myself. It's three things that proximity does for you. It allows you to learn, do, connect. Learn, do, connect. By the way, if as a person who is serious about personal growth and all you people are, if you get up every day and you go, in my context, I need to make sure I learn something, mm. that's relevant. I do something about it or you know, do something that really matters to me, and then I'm making sure I'm connecting with the right people, uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna progress. But, but it is not... You have got to be willing to say, will I drive an hour and a half on a Friday night to do a high school football game mm. on a local FM station called 92.9 The Bear mm. and realize that 26 people are listening? <laughs> and you're going to be away from your wife and three kids that night. And by the time you get home, it's going to be close to midnight. Your wife's going to be asleep. Your kids are going to be asleep. And your heart's going to ache a little bit. Mm. And you're dealing with this conflicting cocktail mix of emotions where, boy, it was, boy, when I was doing the game and preparing to do the game, and when I was down on the field before the game talking to the coaches, I thought I was Jim Nance on CBS. I thought I was doing the Super Bowl with Tony Romo as the color commentator, and I loved it, and I was alive. Mm. But then when it was over and I walked to the parking lot, and I realized there wasn't anybody there to go, good job, Ken. You mm. were better this week than last week. Nobody told me good job. And I got to drive an hour and a half, and I'm now feeling guilty that I didn't spend that hour and a half with my wife and kids on that Friday night, and I'm going to get up and do this next Friday night, and I actually can't see one real benefit to advancing my career to doing this, but somehow I feel like I'm supposed to be doing it. Now, folks, until you have wrestled with that, so what, in that you're moment, not willing to do what it takes. What keeps you from throwing in the towel when the, the doubt and the fear and the second guessing is, is at the pinnacle, and your emotions are really circling what do you anchor to, to to double down? Because I knew that if I quit that, that I would quit something else. Mm. It, it, it's it's the teaching of my mom and dad. It, it, you know, there's some character that's developed, and I think that what kept me going in those moments. By the way, nobody's ever asked me that, and I've never answered that question. But it was as clear as I could be. I mean, I knew that if I quit doing that, the high school football thing, when I Went to that broadcasting school. I asked that guy to give me an opportunity. He gave me the opportunity. The school was done, but he still wanted me to do it. And he said, I can't pay you, but it's an opportunity for you to get better at this. And at that point, I'm trying to figure out what the path is, but I know it's broadcasting. If I quit that, I got to look at my wife and tell her I quit because mm. I don't see any affirmation there. Well, see, if I'm going to, if I'll quit that, then I'll quit three stages later mm. when, when, you know, I'm moving up. But it's still not like there are so many stages on the climb, Danny, where nobody's watching. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Right. Like a lot. It's lonely. It's it is very lonely. Now mm -hmm. I live in this weird, unbelievable world where I get the benefit of Dave Ramsey's platform, and I'm slowly building my own. Uh, but I, when anybody asks me for a picture today, I love it. Hmm. Not because it makes me feel good, but because I go, huh. They actually appreciate my work enough to say, can I get a picture with you? Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was doing stuff and nobody was watching. And uh, if, if you'll quit early on, you'll quit later on.